Great. Wonderful. Well, welcome Columbia alumni from Sweden and around the world, and a very warm welcome to Robert Kolker, 1991 graduate of Columbia College, for so graciously participating in our alumni book club event. It's truly an honor for us to have you here. First, a bit of background. Bob is a critically acclaimed journalist whose work has appeared in the New York Times, Wired, O, Bloomberg, and New York Magazine, to name but a few. His 2020 book, Hidden Valley Road, became an instant bestseller for its gripping, sympathetic portrayal of the Galvin family and their, battles, and their battle with schizophrenia, in which six out of 10 sons were diagnosed with the disease. Hidden Valley Road landed on a number of several best books of. And after reading this compelling piece of narrative nonfiction, we can all understand why. The Galvin story and your compassionate yet informative writing Bob have stayed with me. We'd like this to be an interactive discussion, so I'll start the conversation, but please raise your hand like this if you have any questions or would like to comment. And don't be shy. This is really a rare opportunity for us to get into the mind of a writer and his work. Once again, Bob, thank you so much for being with us. And I guess my first question to you would be, how did the Galvin family come to your attention? What And what drew you to their story? Um, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for, for making this book talk happen. Thanks to Paul and everyone involved at Columbia for organizing and thanks to everyone for coming out today. I'm really happy to talk about my work in general and Hidden Valley Road and, and how it came about. Um, my only caveat is I'm the only one home at the moment and um, my dog is coming back from an outing with the dog walker sometime in the next hour. So there'll be a tap on the window and I'm going to step away and let the dog in. It'll take about 30 seconds when we hear the tap on the window. But um, apart from that, I'm all yours. Um, but the I'm, I'm very, very happy to talk about how this book happened, but I'll talk a little bit about myself. When I graduated Columbia, I had um, worked for a lot at The Spectator. I was a member of the managing board. I edited the arts and entertainment supplement that came out every Thursdays for The, the Spectator. So I wrote a lot of movie reviews and I really thought I would be an arts and culture writer. I, when I thought about reporting, you know, the people who graduated around that time who wanted to become reporters, they were all inspired by people like Woodward and Bernstein or um, they wanted to be foreign correspondents and I never, or they wanted to cover the White House in some way. None of that ever really appealed to me and reporting kind of intimidated me. Um, and I really didn't discover uh, nonfiction writing or reporting until I was in my twenties and really trying to get writing jobs. And I dialed into it at a completely different level which was at a person to person level with um, community journalism. My first full-time job was a couple years out of out of Columbia after a little bit of hustling because we all graduated in a recession and nobody got any jobs really for a little while. Um, I worked for the West Sider and Chelsea Clinton News, which were two little neighborhood papers that covered the West Side of Manhattan. And I was encountering things that as an undergraduate, I never saw, even though they were happening just a few feet away from campus. There was a drug war happening up at Manhattan Valley in the West 90s and West 100s that I had no clue about. There were battles over skyscrapers, battles with Donald Trump who wanted to build stuff on the West side. Uh, there were people running for office. There were sanitation battles. Everybody had something going on. And I would come back week after week and write about these people who were not you know, celebrities, not major policymakers, um, just regular people struggling with this and that. And I, I appreciated the intimacy of that and also the narrative aspect of it, knowing that I could come back week after week and, and these people knew that I could be relied upon to write about them accurately. And I started to really get interested in long form nonfiction writing at that time. Whereas maybe in college, I read a little bit of Tom Wolfe or something like that. It, it was in my twenties that I started to get ambitious and think about um, you know, Joan Didion and Tom Wolfe and Gay Talese and, and all of the great magazine writers who then went on to write great books. And I wanted to do that one day. I finally got a full-time job in magazines in the mid nineties at Time Out New York. And then my, my career really took shape at New York Magazine, which a job I got when I was about 29. 
And I stayed there for a long time, for like 15 years. And I came up from a junior level there. And more and more, I started to specialize, whereas in the beginning, I would sort of do anything that they threw at me. I really started to um, write more. I became not the person who they would want to write about a profile, the mayor or a movie star or a fashion designer or an athlete. I was the one that they would send to the family that was suffering because of a tragedy that had happened or someone who had been through something extraordinary and had a rags to riches moment, uh, uh, an everyday person who never imagined that they would ever be talking to the media. And so the, there was something about my approach that, that made this my specialty. And because it was New York Magazine, it was a lot of crime stories too. So my first book coming out of that was called Lost Girls. It was a true crime book, but also a social issues book. It was about an unsolved serial killer case in Long Island but it really was also about the families of five of the victims who are all people struggling up and down along the poverty line and who were not noticed by the media until their loved ones were caught up in a case. And it really became like a lot of books that I modeled it after a chance to sort of lift the veil on a part of society that most people didn't see firsthand um, while also having this crime story bubbling around in the background. And, and I realized afterwards that I was really writing about families, families with lots of different um, shifting alliances, lots of difficulties and challenges, sometimes even mental illness. And then a few years later, I got a chance to do all of that on an even bigger level with Hidden Valley Road. I got a call and, and here, you know, that was all a preamble to talk about a little bit how, how the book happened. I was, I had left New York Magazine. I was starting a new job working for Bloomberg Business Week. Um, within a few weeks of starting the job, I got a call from an old editor of mine, John Gluck, who grew up with Lindsay, the youngest member of the Galvins, the, the younger of the two sisters. Um, Lindsay and John had gone to Hotchkiss together. You'll remember that Lindsay ended up going to boarding school at Hotchkiss. And they even dated in high school during Hotchkiss. But um, of course, she never was going to tell anyone at Hotchkiss what her family deal was like. So it wasn't until years later, they remained friends that he sort of started to get the gist of what the family was all about and what had happened with them. And finally, one day, um, she and her sister, Lindsay and Margaret came to him and said, we've been thinking for decades about the best way to tell our story to the world. We thought about a memoir, we thought about a double memoir, we thought about a book where we would interview our family and none of it makes sense to us. And a lot of it is impossible for us and we wanted to, know what you thought about getting an impartial journalist to write objectively, to interview the whole family and to research our history. And he thought of me because he knew from the work I had done at New York Magazine that, that this was, while psychiatry wasn't something I had ever written about or schizophrenia wasn't something I knew about, that I knew about how to write in an intimate and tasteful way about people going through some pretty unspeakable stuff. I got on the phone with the two sisters. I was not inclined to do it at first. I was really skeptical of, not of their story, but of my ability to, of anyone to tell it properly. I was, first of all, horrified by everything that they had been through. I couldn't believe it had all happened to just one family. I couldn't believe that the family was still somewhat together at the end of it. I was just amazed. And I was intimidated by the subject of psychiatry, of, of schizophrenia, I was intimidated by the idea of trying to write about mentally ill brothers. You know, what happens once they become mentally ill? How do they, how do they emerge as real people on the page? But most of all, I thought it wouldn't be workable because I'm a reporter and I know about the medical privacy laws in the United States, the HIPAA laws. And I thought that in order for this book to happen, every single living member of the family would have to be all right with private medical information being shared. And I thought there had to be at least somebody in this family who would stand up and, um, and say, are you kidding me? I don't want a book about the family. And then that would be it. And also I would be caught in the middle of it and I'd be adding to the pain and aggravation of the family. So I didn't feel like it was gonna happen, but I, instead of saying no, what I said to the sisters was, I'll tell you what, what if once a week for an hour a week, um, I got on the phone with a different member of the Galvin family, starting with your mother, who uh, Mimi was about 90 at the time, and talked for an hour. And I would just start the conversation by saying, the sisters are interested in a book. What do you think about that? And just hear what you have to say. 
And what I told the sisters was that after nine or 10 weeks, we would all know one way or another just how possible this was. And if for some reason it wasn't doable, I would hand the sisters my notes from those conversations and they could go off and write a memoir or find another writer. And it would be sort of my good deed for the year. And, and, uh, and so I did that. And by the end of the summer, it became abundantly clear that everybody was ready for it. I think that, um, uh, I think that they were ready for reasons that surprised me. I wasn't I think they all, a lot of them were deferring to the sisters because the sisters had suffered so much as the youngest members of the family. Um, they all said, occasionally the brothers would say to me things like, well, if, the, if Lindsay and Margaret want to do it, then I guess it's okay. And then also the mother, Mimi, after opposing something like this for a long time, she suddenly was interested in it happening because there was all sorts of new medical information about the family, about their genetics that kind of uh, made her feel better about, about herself and kind of showed that she really wasn't to blame necessarily for what happened, she believed. And so she was ready to do it that way. And then they all really believed that their story could help people, could, could help people understand what it's like to suffer in silence, what it's like to be blamed for your own children's mental illness, and, and what it's like to be a survivor, to be a sibling in a family like this where all the attention shifts to the sick children. And so off I, off I went and it was a, a year, more than a year after I first talked to the sisters that I sold the book and then another two and a half years to get the book down. So that, I, I'm sorry if I, I was bouncing around too much but I thought that might be a nice lay of the land to offer before we got talking about it. I promise not to monologue like that again. No, I, I appreciate that. And I'm sure the rest of the community does as well, because that was sort of like the link that, that I was curious how the story came to be. And, and now we know that it was through Lindsay's uh, connection, really, that, that the story came to your attention. Um, I think one, first of all, does anybody have any questions that would be like to come in, uh, cut in uh, based on what um, Bob has shared with us? Anybody? Well, I guess one thing that really struck me is that not only did it take a lot of courage for the Galvin siblings to speak to you, I also think it took a lot of courage for you to put a lot of their stories on paper, on the page, because some things were very difficult to read, even for us as the reader. Um, the, the, the sexual abuse, um, the, the murder suicide, et cetera. Um, how, how did how did you approach that? Um, yeah, I you know everything, all the most difficult aspects of the family story, they all came out in that first phone call with the sisters. I remember sitting, I was at the offices at the offices of Bloomberg in New York, which is all glass walled. like everybody can see everyone all the time. And I was sitting in a conference room looking at everybody work, and I was listening to these two women talking about, sexual abuse and about um, a murder suicide and um, about their, you know, saying their mother was in denial, all these difficult things. And I was just like, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it, but they were ready. I think um, one, another thing I hadn't considered was that it had been decades since a lot of the most difficult things that happened to this family happened. So they had had many, many uh, years to process it, a lot of therapy to go through. And um, Lindsay and Margaret in particular had, um, uh, were determined to to find a way to have their story be inspiring to others, a story of survival. So it did not take a lot of teeth pulling for me to talk with them about it. They would talk about it uh, as much or as the as the it required to tell the story. But also, I think my approach and the reason why I think they were might have been comfortable with me is that my approach is never to come at stuff like that as a rubbernecker. I, I, I'm really non-sensationalistic when writing about difficult subjects. The, I, I write a lot about what happened before. I write a lot about what happened after, the ripple effects. You, you may notice that in Hidden Valley Road, the sexual abuse that happens at the hands of the older brother might be on two pages of the book. And it's a, was it a 500 page book? It, 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 the book goes on a while at sort of to talk about the, the aftermath and the, and, and the many years of therapy that Lindsay in particular has in sort of reckoning with what happened to her. And so the, the idea is to try to approach it all maturely. 
but I don't want to suggest that I had some sort of magical quality to bring all this out in them. They were ready. They wanted to tell that story. And as a, and I find that I'm, I'm often surprised as a reporter, just how many people are ready to tell their story, how many people you don't have to pull teeth. They've been, sometimes they've been quiet for so long that they've kind of been rehearsing in their minds what they would say to somebody who they trust enough to talk to. And if you become that person, then it's best to get out of their way and just let them let them talk and let, let them say what needs to be said. And then maybe of course, follow up with more questions from there. So my job was to sort of to be an enlightened witness to them and to keep coming back to Colorado, keep spending time with them with both sisters and then branch out and talk to everyone else and be as, um, be as accepting of it as possible. Uh, and that certainly came through. We have a question here from, um, Anne Tornqvist, who is an investigative journalist here in Sweden and has written her own um, book about uh, true crime here in Sweden. And her question is, hi, just would like to know if the family got to read chapters before publication. Um, I'm, I'm really um, honored to, to, that you're on the call, Anne. Uh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and um, and yeah, I, I'm happy to talk about that question. So so in that the last question, I answered talking a lot about how I was I do my best to sort of empathize and be and not be exploitative when talking to sources. Um, but there's another side of the coin, which is that I do remain um, an objective journalist and not an advocacy journalist. Um, I feel like I kind of go right up against the line of flipping over into advocacy journalism. You'll notice there's nothing in this book that's like takes up the flag for the family and says who will speak up for this family or we must you know help them or and help people like them. It's sort of the the tone kind of remains somewhat dispassionate on that score because I feel like it's a much more powerful book that way. Um, or and it's really just not the way I'm wired as a journalist. And that means that I follow all the conventional rules. I don't share um, the finished product with the subjects of my writing. Um, and in this case, the family didn't read the book until a couple months before it was published because the book had been finalized and we were lining up media for the book. And um, suddenly People Magazine wanted to interview various members of the family. And it was at that moment that I said, well, that's just not fair. Like I can't ask the family to do interviews for a book that they haven't read yet. It's time to show them the book. And so the, it went out to all of them and everybody had different opinions. Um, Margaret in particular was um, had lots to say about her role in it because she felt like she sat outside the family for so long and she wanted more of herself in the book. Uh, there were lots of long conversations, but by the time the book came out, um, uh, you know, everyone was sort of on board and 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 happy that the happy that the book was being received in a in a constructive way, that it didn't come off as feeling like um, they were, um, exploiting themselves for attention or anything like that. It, it seemed high-minded, the whole project seemed high-minded and everybody sort of got behind it for that reason. But I mean, I have to admit, showing it to the family a couple of months earlier was helpful because there were some fact changes, some, some names, some spellings of streets and ge geographical things, minor things, but things that I was really happy to have caught that a fact checker and I did not catch. So that was good. That's that's very good, and I certainly would definitely do not think that the book was exploitative in any way, um, or that the family was trying to bring undue attention to themselves because it is such a, a difficult story, and you know, triggers a lot of uncomfortable conversations. I, I I would assume amongst themselves and and for the readers. So I I think that I can only sort of see sort of like unselfish reasons why they would want to um, make that story available for, for other people. Um, here's another question. Um, let me see here. One more question. What impact has the success of the book and the awareness, and the awareness of their story had on the family? And that is from, let me see here. Uh, that is from Michael. Michael Lynn, Michelle Lynn, excuse me, for Michelle Lynn. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks, Michelle. I am, um, everyone's happy that it was a grown up book, that it wasn't like a, like a trashy uh, 
it didn't doesn't read like a tabloidy tell all. So uh, with that baseline, people are satisfied. Um, Michael Galvin, who is the, the brother who still lives closest to Colorado Springs, the hometown, he's the one who's most um, often inclined to run into people at the supermarket who he grew up with and who know about the book. And so the book is a little bit more in his face every day than it is for some of the others. And he's uh, reported a little bit of stress about that. He would rather not be the guy at the market who had a book written about his family. He'd much rather live his life quietly. And so he's been a little bit annoyed by that. Um, the family without me is, is working on some sort of documentary about them and he's not participating in it for that reason. Um, Margaret, the older sister, the one who, who creates a little bit of distance between herself and the family at the end of the book, she, after being thrilled to talk to Oprah Winfrey and, and to do a few other interviews, started to drift away from doing press from the book. She, she kind of um, felt like this book's success was giving her permission to do things that she had been hoping to do all along for in recent years, which is sort of start a new chapter of her life. And so she hasn't really been in much touch with the rest of her family since the book came out. And um, while we've had some polite emailing back and forth, we're not really in steady touch as well either. But she does talk to readers who are inspired by her story. And she does, as an artist, she still is engaging with her family story through her art. And she's really into art therapy and re running workshops on that as well. I can say that I, I actually, I really think her art's really good, which is, again, kind of a relief because when you're a reporter interviewing someone and they say, I'm an artist, like you kind of hold your breath because you don't want to, you, you want to be polite about, about their art, but, but she, her art is really fantastic actually. Um, Lindsay, um, again, the book has sort of set in motion stuff she has always wanted to do. She's become more of an advocate on behalf of families with severe mental illness. She's joined the boards of a couple of organizations she is very interested in the phenomenon of anosognosia, which is a lack of self-awareness. You know, people don't believing that they are mentally ill and therefore are refusing medical treatment. She deals with it all the time with her brothers who don't believe that they're sick. And so she is on the board of a few organizations that try to help and support families that are dealing with that issue in their family of dealing with a, a severely ill family member who refuses treatment. And um, she's become very animated and active on that issue. And actually we've appeared together at a couple of psychiatry conferences in the past year after the pandemic. In that brief period before Omicron, suddenly we were, we were going to the same events for a little while. So it was nice to see her. Um, and, um, you know, and then, then other brothers have been, have, have been generally you know, praising the book, John, who lives in Idaho, who left the family geographically kind of earlier. He said he learned a lot from the book because he, you know, a lot of stuff happened after he left. Both he and his wife really liked the book a lot. Richard, who is a businessman, he um, was, he met, he and Mark Galvin, they both met with Oprah also on Zoom and were interviewed for Oprah's special. So they were really happy about that. There, there's been some interesting things happening for, with the family. Um, I have to say, I'm sure they're a little exhausted by the attention at this point, and none of us had expected that the book would have would be received and be, be with such high visibility. I remember being on the phone with Margaret, and she was basically asking, "So, what should I expect?" And I said, "Well, I think there'll be a lot of media attention for a couple months, and then your life will probably go back to normal after that." But really, it turned out to be a year or more before she probably could say that things really were normal for her. So that's, you know. I could say the same thing, actually. Oh, that's wonderful. We, we have another question. Um, it is from, let me just see the name here. Oh, I'm sorry. It is from, I believe, Astrid. Astrid. And she said, hello, congrats on the book. This is probably one of the best nonfiction books I've ever read. As a journalist myself, I was wondering how you organized yourself to keep track of this very rich story. And that's from Astrid Landon. Hi, Astrid. Thank you. Um, um, so I, I had two big challenges I felt with, with the book in terms of assembling it. The first was to tell the family story, and the second was to find some way to weave in a history of mental health treatment and of the, the story of schizophrenia. So I started two very, very separate timelines um, to get the chronology down for both of them. So the schizophrenia timeline begins around the time they first come up with the word schizophrenia around the turn of the 20th century. 
and then continues from there. And I'm stuffing it. And when I say timelines, I don't mean names and dates. I mean a file that could end up being 100,000 words long with lots of interviews and clips and, and, and you know, links to PDFs and, and, and all sorts of things um, to, to talk about how the theories of the illness had changed over time. And as we know, of course, it may not even be one illness. It may be several illnesses that we call schizophrenia. And, and uh, just trying to wrestle to the ground exactly what happened when, because I find that the chronology really helps me make sense of things. I kind of think in that narrative way. And then the family, very much the same thing, a separate family timeline. And then at some point, um, you know, I think it's everyone's, in, a lot of journalists have the impulse to over-report and to just keep going and going. And at some point you have to decide it's time to sit down and see what you have. And that's when I, I go through everything very carefully and I start to make lists of what ought to be scenes in the book, what I really ought to highlight in the book. And that's when I arrived at this idea of how the debate over nature and nurture with schizophrenia would become a theme that would pop up era after era after era. And, and then and only then did I figure out a way to sort of weave it all in together. And it was a lot of trial and error. I'm a big believer in a very sloppy first draft that could change significantly. Um, I remember at one point I thought to myself, should I even have this much science in the book? Am I just showing off? Am I trying? I, I, I've read a lot of nonfiction books where the authors are sort of boasting about what the, their research or sort of retailing all the cool things they've learned along the way, but that they, they aren't necessarily telling a story. They kind of are putting the brakes on the story to say, here's another interesting thing I learned while working on the book. And I did not want the book to do that. And so I said to myself, well, what if, I, what if I just took all the science out? What if this just was the family story? So I tried that once and I started reading the family story and I started gasping for air. I, I, I realized you really need a break from some of the difficult things that are happening with this family to get a little bit of context, at, to take a breather and, and understand what was happening uh, more broadly in terms of the thinking about the illness when different things were happening to the family. So I, I felt good about that. Oh, you're muted, Jennifer. Here we go. Thank you. My apologies. Oh, wonderful. We have gotten some more good questions. Um, here we go. I have um, a question here from Elizabeth Rowley, who I know is here in Sweden. Hello, Elizabeth. A question about the writing process. It may be related to Astrid's. It was interesting how the family story unfolded through chapters that focus on one or two family members highlighted in the beginning of each um, chapter. Yes, that was very good. I like that too. There must have been some dilemmas in figuring out how to best do that. How, the, how to best do that. How did you decide to use that approach? I'm, I'm really glad you asked that because the, there is a drawback to doing everything chronologically and that's that you become married to telling a story that has a million things all happening in the same period of time. And you, you wind up using the word meanwhile a lot, right? Um, if the and and so I had some early chapters uh, of the book or early versions of the book where there would be a chapter talking about everything that happened in 1972, for instance. And I would say also that year this happened, and also that year this year that happened, and that uh, that became dizzying to read and really hard to follow. And I already knew I had a a narrative challenge to tell with 14 different people in the family to tell the stories of, plus the medical researchers. So I started to. Uh, hyperventilate a little bit and, uh, and, and I wondered how best to handle that. And so I kind of tried to do what came naturally for the first draft. And then I hit, I sent that first draft to my editor and anybody who's worked on a long book knows that your editor doesn't get back to you for weeks because they have to read the whole book and think about it and come up with notes and ideas. And I had nothing to do um, but sit and be nervous. And I thought, well, I, I need to distract myself. Maybe I'll read War and Peace. I've never read War and Peace. So I started reading War and Peace and it ended up taking me a year to read War and Peace. But it was extremely helpful because unconsciously, I think I was drawn to it because it's a book with a million characters in it who you have to keep track of. And what I saw in War and Peace is that he has no problem doing a really long chapter that focuses on just one person doing one thing. And it, he, at no point in the middle of the chapters does he say, by the way, while, while Andre is doing this, Natasha is doing this a few hundred miles away. He doesn't bother with that. It, and the reader reading it 
trusts that he's going to come back to Natasha in another chapter, that, 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 that you'll, you'll learn what, what else is happening another time. And I kind of exhaled a little bit and I thought, well, that's, you know, that's better. That's obviously better. And so in a lot of my revisions, I ended up saying, okay, there's going to be a chapter about Michael at the commune and it won't matter really what else is happening at the same time that happens. Um, or there's going to be a chapter about Margaret and her first marriage um, to that guy, you know, that, that we're going to, we're going to have these set pieces and it's okay. And so that was very uh, educational for me as I was working on it. Well, I think for us as the reader, you definitely painted these really vivid portraits of each member of the family. And also what was interesting is I think that the way that you wrote each individual sort of character slash chapter, it was almost like walking through time, you know, different decades or different eras in, you know, American society, pop culture, et cetera. So that was very fascinating on a number of different levels. So I, I, it worked beautifully. We have another question here from Jill Thraman Legrand. She said, how has meeting the family, researching the book, uh, researching the book, writing the book and the press success following the book changed your life? What do you wish you had done differently? Um, it has been a life-changing experience. Um, it's been, I, I felt myself stretch and grow as I was working on the book. Uh, I was also very excited to have this project to work on. I, I got to work on it starting in the middle of 2017 full time. And this, this was a period where journalists were focusing you know, on Trump and on, and on you know, really difficult things. To be able to dive in and focus on one family was actually um, kind of refreshing and a little less fraught. It was it was a way to sort of focus my life a little bit. So the process of it was was a was exciting for me. Um, it also was my second book, so I was determined not to make it a terrifying experience. My first book, I was so afraid of failing that I was what kind of white knuckling it the entire time. Whereas this time, I was determined to have more work life balance, and I um, you know I learned to cook a little bit. I got a dog. You'll see the dog later when he comes home. And um, you know, I, I, I had a, a better a better time of it while working on it, but that's not really your question. Meeting the family was was amazing. I I was very concerned that that writing about the mentally ill brothers would be a non-starter, that that they would be, be on the page, they would turn up then as sort of pod people and, and that they wouldn't have personalities. And the, the, the day I met the three surviving mentally ill brothers, all of that went out the window. I realized that they are, you know, people with personalities, that, that I wasn't visiting anybody in a maximum security Hannibal Lecter kind of situation. These are people who are in group homes or in nursing homes who have conversations, who sometimes go out to dinner and, and, they, are, and they all are different from one another. And so that was, you know, it enriches a person's world to meet people like that. And I feel kind of honored to be in their lives as well. And, um, uh, and then to be able to, to talk intelligently about schizophrenia, which is something that I knew basically nothing about in the beginning, you know, that's, that's been amazing as well. Um, to, to every journalist wants to be able to sort of go in cold to something and learn enough about it that they have something to offer other people in the way of perspective about it. And uh, a book allows you the time and the space to do that. And while that's nerve wracking in the beginning, it's immensely rewarding. Um, in terms of what I would do differently. Well, if I, if I had known the book would be this explosive, I might've managed expectations slightly differently when talking with the family. I might've said to them more things like, you know, that you'll be, you'll, we, we all are going to be very exposed when this book happens. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be quite something. And so I, I want to be sensitive, a little more sensitive to that. Whereas before I went in real life, when it happened, I was doing more of a, um, I was more reactive to what was going on. Like Oprah wants to talk to us. Who wants to talk to us? You know, and then everybody's like, should I talk to Oprah or shouldn't I? And I'm like, I don't know, do what you want to do. And, you know, and then it starts to get very chaotic. So I would have been tried to, you know, keep the temperature a little calmer during the most exciting period. 
But I, I actually think that it probably came across as much more authentic the way that you approached it, Robert, you know, in, in a sense that because nobody knew what was how the book was going to be received and how much it would actually resonate with people. Um, another question from Michelle Lynn. She's wondering how you dealt. Hold on a second. I'm so sorry. How you dealt with this emotionally wrenching. Forgive me. Um, forgive me only because I need to put this a little bit higher. How you dealt with this emotionally wrenching story and being so close to it for so long from Michelle Lynn. Um, my, my previous book was talking with five families that were in the middle of an active murder investigation. Uh, and and the women all involved were had were had been sex workers who were murdered and and so they were really all everybody was in the absolute worst moment of their life and and I was sitting there knocking on the door hoping to talk to them and that was really really wrenching so I suppose everything is relative um, the schizophrenia piece of this was very intimidating to me because it was new but the act of speaking with people about about um, traumatic moments in their lives was something I, I had a, a lot of hours of experience doing. So I was slightly less apprehensive about it. And, and I was able to be very kind of calm about that piece of it, particularly since everything had happened so long ago. Um, that said, it's never, you know, I, I really don't know what to, what to, um, what to ask someone who's been through the kind of experiences that the sisters had with their brother. Um, I'm going to go get the door. I'll be just 30 seconds, guys. Hang on one sec. Thank you so much, everyone, for all of your questions. We have a couple of more that um, we're going to get through. Um, I'm still navigating this whole Zoom thing two years in, so my apologies for the pauses. <laughs> so um, I'm so happy that... Um, the response has been so um, positive and um, engaged with this story. Um, ah, Bob is back. Wonderful. Hi. Thanks for waiting. <laughs> Wonder yeah, no worries. No worries. Um, on to the next question from um, another one from Anne. Have you ever felt that you have had to let a story go for your own emotional health's sake? either not doing the story at all or just getting to a point where you're like, okay, enough is enough, move on. Yes. Um, uh, I had a period before I started work on this book where I got an assignment to write about um, child exploitation. And it meant sitting in a courtroom and listening to all sorts of really horrible testimony. Um, and um, when I came back from that, I was just like blotto. I, I really needed days to recover from it. and. Um, in hindsight, I think I just realized that I, I saw my limit. Like I saw, like I saw, like I can do this, but only to a point. There, there are certain things I'm just not going to um, engage with and wouldn't be able to engage with again. Um, so yeah, I, I can answer, you know, quite honestly that 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 happened with with this one again. There was the I had the advantage of time. There were there were decades away, and also the the offender was deceased. Um, Jim had died decades earlier. So um, there was a, a kind of a, a kind of a control over the whole thing that was a little bit easier. Oh, you're uh, you're muted again. Now I'm unmuted. My next question is from Neha Jamie Glader, also here in Stockholm. Hi, Robert. I really enjoyed reading your book. How have the hospitals or institutions where different members of the family were, were admitted reacted to the book? Has it put a spotlight on the treatment of schizophrenia? Um, there, there are two researchers in the book who are absolutely thrilled about the attention that, that's been paid to schizophrenia. Um, Dr. Friedman at the University of Colorado in, in Denver and um, and of course, Dr. DeLisi in Massachusetts, they are, they're getting calls and emails and even contributions for their research. And so they're, they're amazed. Uh, Dr. DeLisi is the outgoing head of an international schizophrenia organization. And I had did an early Zoom with her at their annual conference during COVID when it was all virtual. And so it was nice to be able to have that platform as well. But I think the, 
aside from the genetic research that she's doing, the real value there is to talk about the families because a lot of the times the researchers are disconnected from the families themselves. And I, I was with, in the case of Dr. DeLisi, I was really connecting the family with, the, with, with her in a way that she hadn't been connected to them before. So that was exciting. Um, the, um, the, the, the folks at Pueblo at the state mental hospital um, they all, of course, are, are not the same people who were treating the brothers years ago, um, but I think they were pleased um, to, to see, you know, to get a little bit of perspective, even though it, it was a look at a slightly less complimentary period in the hospital's history. Um, I, I got some good feedback from them because they, you know, you know, in a way it helps people appreciate the, um, the challenge uh, that, that everybody is facing. And, and I also think just to piggyback a little bit on, on that question, I think that one thing that you really highlighted in the book is how the um, treatment or the cure can be almost worse than the, than the disease. I think that was very evident in what happened to um, Donald and, and Jim and, um, and the other brother who died of, um, of heart failure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, and I also think the, the one brother, um, was it Michael who went to the commune and in a way felt that he sort of like has kind of like self-medicated or, or cured himself by just the outdoor environment and also Mary's son, they chose that course of treatment for him as well when he was displaying anxiety. So I think that there are a lot of options that you introduce in the book that I think would be so much more helpful in this day and age than what the brothers went through. Um, when they were sick in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, there is more subtlety in the way that, that people can be treated or even medicated. It's not a blunt instrument the way it was years ago, but there are certain things that haven't changed. It, it, the, there's been no new revolutionary class of drugs to help people with schizophrenia, not for 50 years. And that, when I first learned that reporting on the book, I was shocked because I, I, we all have been living in the age of biological psychiatry where depression and anxiety and bipolar disorder are all, you know, happily, you know, getting some excellent treatments through medication, but schizophrenia doesn't have anything new like that. Um, and when I was writing about it, I thought to myself, is this controversial? Is this going to upset some people? But everybody in the medical field and in the pharma field who has read the book they, they all say, yes, that's exactly what's happening. It's not controversial in the slightest. We have no innovation at the moment and we desperately need it. So hard to believe. Um, the next question um, from, oh, okay. The, the, these were mostly comments, um, comments to what you've said. Um, if anybody else has any direct questions, please feel free to put it on the chat. Um, I do have, uh, a couple of thoughts um, that I'd like to um, ask Bob about, though. You bring up um, Oprah quite a bit. So I, I was wondering if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about that moment uh, when you found out that she'd be choosing your book, et cetera. Was it prior to publication that they let you know or? Um, yes, the, the call came maybe four or five weeks before publication because they need time to ramp everything up and they need the, to get the stickers on the books for the publisher and, and to have it all ready for the day of publication. And um, it came completely out of nowhere. I never even dreamed it would happen because so many of the books she picks are fiction. Um, it didn't seem possible. I learned later that uh, the books editor at Oprah Magazine who of course had gotten a copy of the book had handed it to her because she was going to go to work on a um, on a documentary about mental health that she was doing with Prince Harry for the Apple streaming service, and um, she said to Oprah, "Well, you're doing something on mental health. This new, this new book is coming and could be a big book. Maybe it'd be, and it would interest you." And then Oprah came back and said, "Why don't we make this the Oprah book?" And everyone around her said, okay. And that, that, that appears to be the way things happen with Oprah books that either she finds it herself or one of a handful of people who are in her world kind of pass something to her that they think she'll like. Um, there, there is no formal search service for, for Oprah. Um, and then she called, she wants to be, she wants to have that like sweepstakes moment where she calls the person and breaks the news. So I got the phone call one day when I was like sitting at home wondering 
how the oncoming pandemic was going to affect book sales. And, and I was just amazed and immediately relieved. I felt, well, the book is definitely going to have a readership now. I can exhale a little bit. And um, it was just thrilling. And then later on, um, she did an, uh, a special for, the, for Apple, her book club special, where she interviewed me and various Galvin family members. And, I, and I, we also did an Instagram interview. And I learned firsthand just how good she is at making people feel at ease. That even though she obviously is a you know, one of the most famous people on the planet, she kind of makes you feel comfortable, even virtually through a screen. She's able to kind of help you relax and just make it feel like you're talking to somebody you've known for a million years. And that's something that's really special that I don't, I don't know if, um, you know, I don't know if a lot of people have that same thing that she has, but she really has it. So I really appreciated it. As someone whose job it is making people comfortable when, you, when I interview them, I, I kind of said to myself, wow, she's, she's good. She's really good. So you were on the other end of that uh, at that at that moment with Oprah, <laughs> right? Um, and it was early. Yeah. It was early in the Zoom era too, so like <laughs> everything felt a little peculiar and weird. Uh, in a strange way, I can imagine that perhaps the book coming out right during the pandemic, as we know, more people had time to read during those months uh, of lockdown and book sales shot up, etc. So, it, in a sense, perhaps even though you were not able to go out and do live events, uh, your book probably reached a wider audience nevertheless because people had more time to read. Um, yeah, sure. And if there had been no pandemic, I would have I would have done some in-store book events around the country, maybe a half dozen, and then that would have been it. There would have been no video part of it. And I ended up doing, I don't know, more than 100 you know, Zooms with, with bookstores and mental health organizations and colleges and um, charities um, uh, all around the country. It was, it's, it's been amazing. Wonderful. Um, so one thing that really struck me about the, the book is that it, it's very visual. In my mind, I was visualizing so much of it and parts of it are also rather graphic and, and like I said, uh, uncomfortable. Um, but there is a very cinematic quality to it. So I was wondering if the book has been optioned at all, if there's going to be any sort of book to screen um, adaptation taking place. I know that The Lost Girls came out on Netflix um, a while ago, so or a little while ago, not so long ago. So and I was just wondering what the plans were because I, I kind of was imagining different uh, actors in, in various roles, I must admit. Um. It did get an option for a possible miniseries, but I there is nothing unfortunately to report about that. There, I did. I wasn't involved in the adaptation for Lost Girls, although I certainly liked the movie that they ended up making, and um, I kind of cheered on the sidelines over many many years as it went from studio to studio to studio. It really went. It really had many lives. Lost Girls. Um, this one. Last year, I was involved in writing uh, one a script for a pilot for a mini series, and that was thrilling because it was a, another chance to try something new. And I thought it went really well, and everybody really got along well, and it looked really good. But so far, no streamers have picked it up, and I think it's because we're at a moment now where people really want, like, they want Bridgerton, or or you know something escapist and fun, or that if they want something dark, it's something futuristic and dark, like a sci-fi. Um, uh, uh, series so the so at the moment nothing's happening but I think that that can I've seen as I saw with Lost Girls that changes so maybe next year it'll get picked up and become a series I hope so because I would really like to see how um, someone um, interprets your work <laughs> on the screen um, my next question would be, you, you alluded to it in the beginning in terms of how your Columbia education or experience um, prepared you for the kind of work that you're doing now, but um, what kind of advice would you give to either students or even alumni on this call who might have certain aspirations or dreams or would like to let, you know, do, do a career change? Um, what type of advice would you give to any budding writers or journalists out there? Well, I think I entered the workforce coming out of Columbia. Like I kind of came in kind of hot thinking I was hot stuff and I was going to, you know, that I'd worked at, at, a, at the school newspaper of a selective college and I had interned at 
Rolling Stone and the Museum of Modern Art and, and all these other places and that, that I, I had this pristine resume and that the world was just going to take me in their arms. And then I, when, I, when I saw that you kind of have to start all over again, I kind of learned that hard lesson of, of making sure that you love the process of what you do rather than the outcome because you can't quite often can't control the outcome of what you do. You can only control the process. And so when I started gravitating toward the sort of work I'm doing, I realized that it was very much in line with the stuff I enjoyed doing as an undergraduate. Uh, I'm not just being published at the school newspaper, but also I was a history major and the narrative aspect of history really appealed to me. I love the storytelling part of it. And so uh, this is a long way of answering your question, which is to say that if people are, are planning a pivot at any point in their life, they might want to look back to either college or, or another unpressured moment in their life where, where they found they really enjoyed the sort of thing they were doing, because that might be a clue into what they could do next. Um, but uh, I mean, I'm, hindsight's 2020. It's not like I sat there as a history major saying, one day I'm going to write uh, a narrative nonfiction book. You know, it, it was only looking back that I realized that the things I liked doing in class are, were the things that I liked doing with the book. That's a great piece of advice. I, I, I think I'm, uh, that's a great takeaway. Enjoy the process, not only the outcome. I think that, that <laughs> I think I'm gonna like put that on my computer. Um, now yeah, we have I mean, another- I wanted, I wanted my parents to calm down. Like I was, I, was, I was looking for a job and I was applying everywhere and I wanted to come home and say, good news. I'm a fact checker at the New Yorker magazine. And they would say, phew, <laughs> everything, everything's going to work out for you. And I would say, yes, that's right. And then everything would be fine. But it, you know, it, of course it didn't happen that way. And, um, and, and you kind of have to trust that if you're, if you're learning and growing and, and doing the things you want to do that eventually, you know, the, the jobs will get better and better and better. Wonderful. A couple of other questions have come in, Bob, so I'm excited. This is from Christina Anderson, a journalist here in Sweden, and Christina's work has appeared in uh, the New York Times, uh, for example, reporting on Scandinavia. And she mm -hmm. says here, hi, Robert, really enjoying this talk. What did you learn from knocking on doors for the lost girls? What advice do you have for reporters who need to reach out to potentially unwilling participants? Um, hi, Christina, thank you. Lost Girls was a, an amazing reporting experience because there were many, many reversals. I, I did a magazine story about the case where I brought together family members of the, of the victims for the first time and they all sat and talked to one another and that more or less went rather smoothly and then they all ended up on the cover of the magazine and after that I thought, well, maybe this is a book. And so about a month later, I went back to all of them and I said, good news. You know, I want to write a book about you guys, and they all shut me down, and it was it was horrifying because I had already made the book deal, and it all seemed like it was going to go fine, and then suddenly the sources were not interested in talking to me, and um, and what had happened was in the interim they were exhausted. They had done interviews with Twenty Twenty and with Forty Eight Hours and uh, different. Uh, uh, they they kept coming into the city to do these interviews, and they were missing work, and they weren't getting, and and nobody was coming close to solving the case. And so they started to wonder what would be the point. And also a book would, would be more detailed and would probably air some dirty laundry that they wouldn't want aired. And so I, um, I had to kind of regroup and, um, and, and um, stay positive and make sure that I um, put on a very positive face to, toward them as I continued to report the book. And there was plenty to report beyond what the family members were saying. Um, these women were all well into their 20s. They all had lives outside of home. They had friends. They had people who knew them uh, independent of their families. So I started to interview them. Of course, there was the whole police side of this that I did work on. There were the neighbors in, the play, in, in one, one part of Long Island where a crime had happened that I could interview people there. So there was plenty of work to be done. And I just kept a brave face up and I kept coming back to them saying, hi, it's me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm putting in a good faith effort here. I really think this could be an important uh, book that could help people understand, uh, you know, your lost loved one better. And slowly but surely, you know, first one family came around and then another and then another. 
but there were periods in there where I really was going to lose, was losing heart. I remember turning to my wife, who's also a journalist and also a Columbia alum, Kirsten Danis, Columbia class of 92. Um, and I said to her, why am I doing this? Like, why am I writing this book about these, these women in this case, if their families, you know, don't even want it to happen? Like, you know, wh why would I bother doing this? And she said, well, you have to ask yourself who you're writing it for. You know, are, are you writing a, a, a gift for the families or are you writing something for the public to understand the women who are dead? Um, uh, are you writing about a certain type of case that's all over the country? You know, anonymous sex workers who are killed in any number of cases and then are forgotten. You know, who are you really doing it for? And that kind of straightened me out and, and helped me kind of stay directed no matter what the families did or said. And then what happens is eventually people in that situation realize that the train is leaving the station and that they are better off having their say than not. And so most of the time they eventually want to talk to you. The key is to never break your posture, to never threaten them, never become oppositional, ne never say to them, you listen to me, I'm writing a book with or without you, so you better get on board. Like that you'd never, ever, ever make it a confrontational situation. Instead, it's it's always win-win. It's always, I can't wait to help people understand, uh, you know, the real truth about what's going on here. I I am learning so much, and it's been very exciting to be able to tell this story. I really can't do it without help, so I really would love to be able to talk to you, and just over and over and over again. That's a great piece of advice. Um, next question from um, was there another one? Let me see here, just bear with me. Ah, this is from Anne Tornquist. This is a really good question, Anne uh, said. If they included the reporter in a miniseries, in other words, you, that would be you, Bob, which actor would you like to play you? <laughs> um, I always say Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, who's Obviously. your second choice? <laughs> Um, I don't know when I when I, I'm I'm like I'm in, I'm 53 now, but a few years earlier people would say I looked like Michael Sarah, but now it's just too, you know, he's obviously way younger than I am. Um, uh, but that happens, right? Like my my uh, my old colleague Jessica Pressler has been portrayed twice now in in the movie Hustlers and in this new thing on Netflix about Anna Delphi, the, the new okay. Shonda Rhimes show. Like there, there are reporter characters that are based on her twice. So she's really, <laughs> uh, I'm sure she never predicted that would happen. That's funny. I, I say I vote for uh, Matt Damon. I don't know. <laughs> I think Matt Damon would be good, right? I yeah, think Matt well, Damon well, would he be went, awesome. <laughs> he went to Harvard, right? So. Yeah, he did, exactly. Know. Well, we need to find, we need to find a Columbia, um, we need to find a Columbia <laughs> actor. Paul, you need to get on the alumni list of Columbia <laughs> actors who could play uh, Bob. Um, well, our, our hour is coming to a close and I, I wanna say thank you so much, Bob, for taking the time to speak with us and to everybody who um, went in and for all the wonderful questions. And um, can you tell us anything about how your mind is working for the next project, Bob, or is it definitely sort of just like everything is open and undecided? <laughs> um, I, um... I don't necessarily think the next book would be about mental health or mental illness. Um, I'm really more interested in the story first and then the subject area. The story becomes a window into the subject area and not the other way around. Um, I've been writing some magazine stories. I did one for the Times Magazine last year and I'll do some more this year. And hopefully those will be a gateway into deeper subjects. And so I'm excited about that as well. I'm just trying to stay flexible and curious and it's um, uh, Jennifer. You and I were talking about this before the the Zoom began, but um, you know it's a little daunting, right? Because the outcome on this one was so enormous. How do I kind of create a situation this time where I'm going to be happy with it no matter what, even if it isn't you know quite as explosively amazingly successful? So uh, that's on my mind as well. I will say though that you have this uncanny uncanny ability though to type into to tap into the zeitgeist because for those of you who may not know Bob wrote this viral piece bad art friend from the New York Times which I encourage you all to read it's a long piece 
um, but it's worth it. I listened to it actually, and <laughs> it was absolutely riveting. And it and, and again, it's it's a lot of subtext. It's something seemingly sort of like innocuous, but sort of like the subtext, the drama, and the characters um, beneath it. And I think that is that is your gift uh, in storytelling. So I look really forward to your future articles and and your future books. And um, thank you so much. And um, Hopefully we can um, check in again when you write your next book. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, everyone. And a, a special salute to those of you in the, you know, in the field out there. I'm, I'm very reachable. Um, I have a website with my email at the bottom of it. So I'm happy to be a resource for anyone going forward. Um, I, you know, I'm always happy to talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>